Quibi was that network that only had 11 minute shows and they were all in uh, portrait format that like kicked off right at the beginning of COVID and then died really fast. And I thought it was really <laughs> funny. I tried to add it as my uh, credit on LinkedIn to pretend I'd been this. Cause I was like, no one else would claim that. And like no one who really had that job would want it. Mm -hmm. uh, and LinkedIn rejected the thing. So it's, the, it's, it's like the time I tried to say that I was, um, I, I tried to post a thing to IMDB saying I was rumored to be playing Jar Jar Binks in the next Star Wars movie. <laughs> Uh, and like IMD was like, no, that's clearly a lie. You cannot put that on your fucking page. Can you uh, give us your best Jar Jar Binks impression? No, I've never seen the film. <laughs> I This is why it's I, I always love uh, anytime we can get a chance to to sit down and chat. This is fantastic. Um, also loving the background too, um, the octopus on the wall and the posters and everything. Yeah, it's my very professional looking office. It does look professional, and you got like a what a couple of pencils next to you. A lot of them, like holy crap! Oh, it's, it's like it's an insane setup of pens there. All right, so Richard, I am good to go. We are green across the board. Everyone that is watching, thank you for tuning in. This is the first I think afternoon uh, show I've done in like half a year at least. It's it's weird timing too on YouTube Anchor. I've been like so far behind on editing. I just got up to I think it was three hundred and eighty or 89 uh our episode uh the when we talked about haunted hill volume one so before uh for the last one and uh that just went live yesterday so it's like the timing of all of this is just perfect um but wow haunted hill one that's like almost a year ago now i know i know and then i took almost like a a couple months hiatus where i just interviewed like it's crazy like one to two maybe four people a month if that mm -hmm. And I was just saying, now I'm going back to my old way where I'm like interviewing everyone like every day now. Um, it's addicting. I need to step back though. So uh, we are green across the board. We're good to go. Everyone that is watching, I just dropped a link to the Kickstarter we are going to be talking about. Be sure to pull that up. Check it out with us. If you're able to back, we would love to see it happen. Uh, only a couple hours left to go. Uh, but if you're unable to back, put that on Facebook and Twitter. Word of mouth is 100% free and it costs you nothing to let all your friends and family know about this wonderful book. Uh, Richard, you good to go? I'm good to go, yeah. All right, I'm good to go, too. So let's begin in three, two, one. Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic indie creator interview. It's your Cape, your Sarah Cody, and we're keeping it geekly with our returning guest, Richard Fairgray. We're here to break down the ex-wives of Frankenstein, issue one and two, and everything in between. Richard, this cover is it's badass. This, it reminds me of the first one. But even even crazier, it's the so that's like a real molded hands holding phones. Yep, yep. It's uh, two paper mache hands that I built inside a wooden box. My original idea was that it would actually be like a closable object, so I could like take it to cons and sell it. But the hands are too big, and so the lid can't close. Um, and then they're holding cell phones that have on them drawings of the two characters that are actually. Uh, it's it's one of these things again where I'm doing that dumb bullshit where I'm like, I'm not going to do any digital anything on this fucking thing. So um, the the original fo the, the photograph, the first photograph I took of it, uh, I just had the phones lit up with the pictures on the screens. Mm -hmm. And then I realized they weren't kind of popping color wise. So rather than um, rather than like change it later, I uh, printed I, I printed it out uh, Essentially, like I, I printed out onto acetate the images that were on the phone screens with a color tint on each one, and then layered those pieces of acetate in front of the camera uh, to try and like line it up. So they're actually like a little bit off. I think you can, if you go really close, you can see they're like off by a couple of pixels worth or something. But um, yeah, it's all all a physical sculpture. And um, the fun part of this one is that when I did it, uh, the the sculpture is in my closet. And it's quite high up and the phones are glued into those hands. So I cannot get those back and they're turned on. <laughs> and what's amazing is if you have a one plus six, which is the old, an old phone of mine, uh, those batteries just fucking last, especially if you're not doing anything with them. So mm -hmm. if for instance, you've reactivated that phone to use for a X, Y, Z of Frankenstein cover, and it still has several alarms set on it, they will just be going off for weeks. I, I do the same thing. I have to have, um, my phone and I have my iPad set up so I don't sleep through my phone. Uh, multiple alarms set up, and then that's not even including the alarm on my dresser. Um, I, my daughter, I, I, we woke up for school this morning, and 
She's like, you, you got a lot of alarms going off. I'm like, hey, we're never late, though. We're always on time. <laughs> Have you seen the um, – that it's like a, it's like a car – um, like with, uh, not it's like a, like a remote control toy car type vibe, but it's an alarm clock. And when it goes off, it zooms off your table and like zooms around the room in like random directions. So the alarm is just going all around you. And oh you have God. to get out of bed and chase it to turn it off. I would be infuriated. Uh, I like I my bed, uh, my Roomba gets stuck underneath my bed, so I can only imagine that car getting stuck. And then like you're tired, you're groggy, you have to move your bed to turn this mm -hmm. alarm off. Mm -hmm. Oh man. <laughs> But it would wake you up. Yes, uh, the cool one. Uh, there's ones where, uh, where a target comes on, you have to shoot it. That 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 looks awesome. Okay, I would be very bad at that. Yes, I yes, I, I yeah, yeah. That was a horrible one for me to bring up. <laughs> so Richard, I had a chance to check out some of these interiors, and I I have to, you know, this is like a reoccurring thing that I always bring up. But you always find new ways to kind of just push the boundaries or push like what a traditional comic feels like and, and create something entirely different you know you you have uh the the wine glass reflection uh that was just blew my mind but then there was the other one where uh they're ice cubes and then they're like in the drink mm -hmm. uh, and it was such a cool image and how did these ideas just populate like how, how do you come up with you know these type of panels well i've been doing this you know basically every day for 32 years at this point um and the biggest challenge I have is how am I going to not be bored today? Like, what can I do to myself? What what hell can I put myself through that will keep this um, this job that I will have until I die uh, engaging to me? Um, I've always said that, like, it takes me less time to draw a 24-panel page than it does to draw a three-panel page. Because the more complicated it gets, the more interested I am and the less likely I am to just get distracted. Um, I think with with... This story, particularly, I I knew that it was going to be like, it's 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 two women having conversations. Like they're going to interesting places or like visually kind of spectacular places, um, and you know, in grimy, horrible ways, but things that I find beautiful. Uh, but they are really just sitting and talking, and I wanted to like really capture the tension of that um, in a way that you know, if this were a film, it would be. Uh, just cutting between close-ups and mid-shots and what have you, um, and there would be some background, but, like, it would be able to hold on these things. And I want to really control time with this story. I want people to, uh, you know, I, I can't direct actors. I can direct drawings to deliver these lines in the uh, strangely stochastic ways that I want them to. Um, and so to do that, the option is either it's 37 panels in a row of someone getting one sentence out with a close up on their face, or I can have them, you know, they're, it's a, they're, they're, metaphorically they're diving into something or they're, they're, or they're like, like hiding in the drink or whatever. So fuck it. Why not do it visually? Why not use the ice cubes as this idea of like, you know, Victoria is swimming in the vodka um, and the, the freedom of that while, Elizabeth is cold and restrained standing on an iceberg being an iceberg herself but being able to use the spear from her martini to to as a as a way to help Victoria up always with the idea that her way of helping is to make Victoria more like her so there's still this like sense of control at all times and I, I get like fascinated by the ways you know the ways that you can visualize um, visualize intention while, without having to stick to literally what is going on you know, and I, I really love that, too, because Victoria is uh, the bride. You know, she's all stitched together and everything. And having Elizabeth trying to, you know, control her or shape her, you know, it's if it just kind of feels like it goes hand in hand. Uh, can you give us a little bit about who these protagonists represent within the story? Sure. So um, the, the pitch that I'm giving over and over again, but I try to make sound fresh, <laughs> it is uh, Elizabeth Frankenstein. Uh, yeah. And then I just like, I, I screwed that was up fresh though. You just did it. You just, <laughs> I just said Frankenstein. What am I doing? It's Elizabeth Frankenstein and the bride of the monster on the day they find out that their husbands are alive, living as a gay couple in the Arctic and returning to the city as heroes of Reddit, Twitter, and the MRA movement. It is a story about two women who have been pitted against each other by society, by men, by literal monsters who realize that in this moment, they have no choice but to rely on each other because no one else could possibly understand what they are about to be dragged back into. You know, and that's such a deep feeling to 
be able to connect with someone in an area that normally no one you feel like you'd be able to connect with, like, you know, where you're most vulnerable or alone. Um, what was your reasoning for choosing uh, Frankenstein and the, you know, the ex-wives of Frankenstein? Um, it, it started out, it was like this kind of joke that kept coming up. This was all uh, 2017, I think, that it first started, maybe 2018, um, where I was, uh, when I was six years old, uh, we had to give a book report at school. Uh, New Zealand schools were a little bit more advanced than American schools, so we were reading and giving book reports when we were six. But I was meant to be doing it on Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, which I think is uh, quite a boring book. Uh, and so I instead had read Dracula. And I fucking loved Dracula. But I was told that I wasn't allowed to talk about Dracula because my teacher was a born-again Christian who didn't like my uh, leanings toward horror. Mm -hmm. uh, so I drew this beautiful cover that was like a terribly drawn replica of the Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing cover. And inside I wrote a book report about Dracula. And I got up in front of the class and I read it out. And I read this whole thing about how Dracula is a story about secretly gay men finding different ways to penetrate penetrate each other while coming up with excuses for it. Obviously, I got in a buttload of trouble. And um, I my, see what you did there. <laughs> my, my, my mother was talking about it. And she said, what was the gay Frankenstein thing you did? And I was like, no, no, it was a gay Dracula thing. And I was like, Frankenstein's not really gay. And I was trying to explain to my mother how Frankenstein isn't gay. And as I was doing this, I was like, wait, Frankenstein is so gay, though. Like, it's about this, <laughs> this man who goes, like, this, like, sniveling weirdo guy who's, like, so insecure that he, like, builds himself a, a, a man that he can, uh, you know, do what he will with. And I don't think it's, like, like, one of the things that I really explore in this story is, are they, like, is this homosexuality or is this pure narcissism? Has he made a man in his own image, someone who he can fuck who, who will never reject him? Um, and, uh, you know, and now with the, 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 the way he's being celebrated for being an out proud gay man on Twitter, um, and a, a hero of the science community for bringing, um, bringing life to the world, um, while also being a hero of the MRA community, because he's literally proven you can create, uh, life without the need of a woman. So he's proving to them that he can make women more obsolete. So he gets like, he gets both sides of everything. Um. It's another thing about like when you are a rich man uh, in the world, you kind of get to do whatever the fuck you want and everyone mm -hmm. will inevitably take your side, at least publicly. And these women who are being forced to like publicly be supportive and they're, they don't get to be in the messy stages of a breakup because there's so much attention on them for this thing they never asked for. So anyway, so five or six years ago, I was trying to explain to my mother that, that Frankenstein wasn't gay. I realized he definitely was. Um, and, uh, then uh, my mother said to me, so what was the bride for? So really, this book is my mother's fault, I guess, um, which is rare. Uh, so sh I, I kind of started playing with this idea of like, what would happen if the bride left the monster? Um, and this went through like many iterations. There was, I, I, I wrote a uh, pilot script for sort of a sitcom version of this thing, where it was very much about just Victoria. Um, on her own and uh, the like the presence of Elizabeth as this kind of like threat uh, or like uh, the, the, just this tension in the world. And I was, it was never going to be about the men coming back. It was always just like, how do these women live after these events? Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized like it kind of wasn't quite where it wasn't the story I wanted to tell. And then there were, I worked with different people at different points or like talked with different people about making it into like um, a stage show. And there were, talks about doing it as a drama and all of these things kind of went away and i just kept coming back to this original idea of like that that first scene in issue one where it is um victoria is has, has read the thing in the self-help book that tells her to like highlight her scars highlight highlight her imperfections with lipstick and then write i am beautiful on the mirror and because she's got so much stitching all over herself the lipstick runs out before she can finish writing i am beautiful didn't that um, come from uh, a real life experience? Yes, that is a, that is a real thing. That is that again, my mother's fault. This is a real thing that my mother had read in a self help book when she was when she and my father were getting divorced. Um, See, I so listen. There's there's <laughs> like there's the, all these pieces from real life and and real people's experiences. You know, inside the cover of the books, I there's a long list of 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 women in my life who I thank for this book because it's 
so many conversations I've had with so many so many people about like the the different ways they've been controlled by someone, mistreated by someone, or like overlooked or put in a position where they they can be right, but they they don't, they don't get to be right out loud. Um, you know, I have a book like Haunted Hill where Eva gets to be uh, like uh, a, a poor version of Larry David. Like she she gets to call everyone out on their bullshit, but she doesn't actually. There, there's there's there are consequences for her. Everyone just hates her, and she has no comfort from it. Um, but she still does it. And then, uh, the, you know, because that's a straight comedy and this book is funny too, but this is far more of a, like, look at, look, like these women are finding the sanctuary with each other because this is the time they can talk to someone else who will understand. I love Even that. Doing it in public. I love that. So, I mean, give us a little bit, uh, just a, a, a brief breakdown. Uh, issue one, you know, what do we see happen in issue one? Um, issue one is the moment that Victoria finds out Elizabeth shows up to her apartment for the first time since uh, three years ago when the when uh, Frankenstein and his monster vanished and everyone presumed they were dead. Um, and she shows up with the newspaper saying that, like, the headline is God and monster found in Arctic. And uh, there's a the, the only very subtle reference I have in here to who who I'm basing Frankenstein and his monster on is you can see the top part of the photo of the two of them together. And I've tried to make it as close as possible to that uh, photo of Elon Musk and Ghislaine Maxwell. Um, so, you know, I'm not, uh, it, it, it's subtle, but not that subtle, what I think of these men. Um, uh, so the, the, the first issue is them, like, just trying to figure out, like, 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 how do we even talk to each other? There's so much bad blood between us. So much shit has happened in the public sphere. We have dragged each other publicly in interviews. We've said these awful things, but like we can't let go. You know, it's the 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 pillow fight episode of Community where Abed and Troy just can't stop hitting each other because as soon as they do, the friendship is over. It's a little bit like that kind of tension. And then, uh, you know, at the end of issue one, Victoria uh, Elizabeth walks out, and then Victoria softens for a second and says, "Like, let's get lunch." And so this is the issue where they are out in the world. And they are, it's kind of like, this, this is, this is the closest they will be like the, the, the barriers are down. They mm -hmm. are really being friends here. Um, and then this is also where the reminders of the shit that's happened before start coming in. So how does, um, and we're going to go ahead and let's switch over to the campaign. Uh, but how does time work in this universe? Like how many issues are you expecting to, uh, you know, uh, pump out for the series. Um, it is a four issue. It's a four issue story um, that takes place over the like this one day. Um, I'm I'm only really interested in like how they are how they are experiencing this day together, and like how you know how that how this news will affect them. I'm not really that interested in telling the story of who they live as you know beyond here if mm -hmm. i have a great idea for that i might come back to this one day but for now it's a four issue arc and everyone watching i mean we are just two dollars away from hitting four thousand dollars someone make it happen while we're live <laughs> i will tell so, you when like the same thing happened at three thousand we were sitting at 29.98 for like nine hours and i was like just just two dollars come on yeah <laughs> so the ex-wives of frankenstein Issue one and two, two women living in the aftermath of monsters, trying not to be monsters to each other. And that is like a hard situation to be in, you know, to try to extend the olive branch, to try to make the best of, you know, your situation and what's weighing you down and, you know, potentially, you know, gain a, a friend out of it. Uh, so what was your inspiration for keeping it across a day? I know... With some of your other series, you know, like Haunted Hill, it follows kind of a similar manner where, you know, each issue uh, correlates to a different, you know, period of that day or, or that time frame. Like, what was, you know, your direction for doing it with this series? Um, I wanted this to feel like one really long conversation. Uh, I think a lot of the time, uh, especially more recently, like the way that we talk to each other has changed. We talk to each other with like, we look for the, the joke to go out on and that kind of thing. I think it's like we're so saturated in media that we learn to speak as if we're scripted. 
And I started thinking like, how do is how can I extrapolate that further? Can a conversation in and of itself be a story? And if so, what are like, what is the journey of this story? Um, and so it's, um, yeah, the, the, the four, four distinct parts of this conversation are, uh, like this antagonistic thing at the beginning, the, um, the, the, the barriers falling down for the second issue and everything being sort of wonderful that is undone by an event at the end of this issue. Um, and then the, the third part where they're kind of just in survival mode, but all of the old stuff has been dragged back up and they get to like, they both get to kind of separately self-medicate while in like, while also going back to the, uh, castle for want of a better word, where it all went down, which is of course just a big skyscraper. And then the fourth is the, is the looking for a resolution while knowing there can never really be one. That is such a deep concept too. I, I love how. You know, your stories usually have such a deep thing behind it. Some some sort of event or some sort of situation where it's such a deep perspective. Um, why center that around it? A resolution knowing there's not going to be one. Uh, because l real life doesn't have resolutions. You know, mm. uh, someone described this book as it's a French cinema disguised as genre fiction. And I think that really is what I'm what I'm fascinated by at the moment. What does that mean? Like, it's, you know, <laughs> it, look, Kickstarter is, is filled with books that are, what if this met this, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is the closest I will get to doing that kind of story. Um, you know, this is, what if Frankenstein met, I don't know, I, I can't think of what the other half of it is, but like, what, what if Frankenstein met my dinner with Andre, I guess. Um, and I, I, the way I want to do that is to like, this is, this is Elizabeth Frankenstein's before trilogy. This is, uh, this is so many small conversational pieces because again, I'm 32 years of making comics. Maybe the challenge now is, can I make conversation visually spectacular? Because mm -hmm. I'm certainly not going to have like, these two are not going to, there's not going to be any explosions. There's not going to be any big, space lasers this is going to be uh finding ways to make the ordinary seem uh just completely engrossing you're so no space rockets shaped like penises no not at all damn damn mm. <laughs> mm. so th this cover this is such a gorgeous cover i'm in love with this cover dennis manhara has done fantastic work as always but this just blew me away mm-hmm just his his coloring mm -hmm. he has such a unique way of like stylizing uh, humans and, and just like uh it's it's such like a watercolor feeling mm. it's also that like everyone in it feels like they're moving there there's no one in this looks posed this is mm -hmm. absolutely like we are spying on an intimate moment i got so I, nerdy someone is right here it looks like with their phone taking a picture right but you know what I mean? like they're not posing for the camera that is mm -hmm. taking the picture that is the cover like that we are we are seeing a moment that they shouldn't that no one knows we're watching um we're spying on intimacy here um i got so nerdy with this when uh dennis had done the the um the drawing part and he was doing the colors and he asked me what i was thinking about for the palette and he said he said something about it. he was like you know he wanted to do it very limited with just them in color them in full color and i just i messaged back i was like uh, I, I like that idea, maybe do the whole thing full color, but then everyone except them has uh, a red color filter over them set to, let's say, like 40%. And he was like, is that specific? <laughs> I was like, I spend too much of my fucking life figuring out what percentage of a color the color holds put on things. And then, and then he went to do it. He's like, by golly, he's yep. right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I can eyeball this shit now. So this cover is gorgeous. Uh, let, what type of coffee would Victoria drink? Um, I have gone back and forth on this because I always think like, I just like black coffee. I want the dirtiest black coffee I can get. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a Starbucks in the streets, Folgers in the sheets kind of boy. Uh, and I like the idea that Victoria would drink the same thing as me, but I think that that is absolutely wrong. She is buying. My guess is like, she wants a cappuccino with an extra shot, but she's also the person who asks every single time how big the cup is that they put it into so that she can figure out what percentage of like how, what the, what the milk to coffee ratio is actually. Going to be. <laughs> and this next cover, this is gorgeous as well. I even love the shout out to the artist right there on the laptop. 
Yeah, I you know I've I've always I, I've been championing Hey Weirdo Amy Wee for so long. I love her stuff. Um, she and I met many many years ago when I was sneaking in backstage at a concert and she was doing press for the show, and uh, we have been friends ever since. Uh, and I'd had this idea, and I'd sort of tried drawing it myself uh, as a pinup back in issue one, and I just kind of couldn't get it to work. And I was like, Amy. We grew up around the same time in the same place. Do you remember when magazines used to have those dress up dolls that were magnets that mimicked the things that our parents had that were paper? And she was like, yeah, I had the Buffy one on my fridge. I was like, perfect. Do that. But with body parts of Victoria, we can go full nude, show the clam, get out there and do whatever you want. And like, she really went hard with it. I'm, I, I love this thing. We actually wanted to get a magnet set made of this. And then like literally 45 minutes before the campaign went live, we found out that it was not possible. Oh, a different reward instead. But I'm very happy that after having to blur out the dildos on the Haunted Hill cover for volume two, uh, I get to have a dildo front and center on this one. I was going to say, uh, everything's covered, but the, the dildo's large and in charge. Well, it's not a dick. It's not nudity. <laughs> <laughs> and then another cool thing. So uh, issue one, you had the uh, emergency sewing kit. Mm -hmm. This time around, you have uh, emergency mini torches. Yep. Oh, hold right on here. one second. One second. Let me. Uh... Proof that they work. The emergency mini torches. You could scare away any monster you like with that. Like just charge out, waving it at him, scare him out of town. Perfect. And and with each of these, you get a uh, there's a QR code inside the box, so you scan that and you can download the comic instantly. That's uh, you did the same thing with the uh, sewing kit, and it's yeah. so cool. Um, what, what do they do? They do they have like a Richard scent to them? Uh, they smell like matches. <laughs> so no. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. I think okay. I've been trying to find a cologne that smells like matches. Like, I'm not a signature scent person because I've never found one. If I could find a cologne that smells like matches, I would be in heaven. And why why, why like not just cologne. light a match near you, Richard? That would be the, the same concept, right? But I'd have to do it all the time. I'd be constantly lighting matches. I guess now. That, I was, now I was I'd be like, cool as, as hell, right? You're just in public, just like, shit. People are like, is he lighting a cigarette? And you're like, no, I'm just, I'm scenting myself. Okay, so here's, here, I'll tell you a little bit. <laughs> I once stole a book from a cafe <clears throat> called uh, It's Fun to Make Magic. It is a creepy ass book uh, with the most like just the weirdest looking dude showing you how to do magic tricks. And I was in a bit of a funk because I'd been at a convention and this guy had come up to me and told me that there was nothing magical about me. And he was an actual magician. So I believed him. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was so rude. He like literally just walked up and was like, hi, sorry. I just needed to tell you. Um, I just get the sense for these things. There's nothing magic about you. And then walked That's off. fucked like, up. <laughs> Wow, I've never been like no 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 amount of shade has ever been heavier. Anyway, so I, I got I stole this book and it had this great trick in it where it was like like collect a large number of buttons of different shapes and sizes and carry it carry them with you at all times. Carefully observe the buttons on your friend's jackets. Then when no one's looking, look through your button collection, find one that's similar, put it in your hand, walk up to them, pull on their button, and then open your hand. And for a moment, they will think that you've damaged their clothing. Like, that's not magic. That's the worst. But it had this one trick in it, which was, like, it taught you how to um, strat, like tape a, a, an old matchbook underneath your lapel. Mm -hmm. And then you could, if anyone ever needed a light, you could just pull a match out of your jacket and it would come out lit. And I was like, that's fucking amazing. That's kind of cool. train myself to do that. It is going to be so cool. I bought all of these matchbooks, and I just, like, practiced and practiced and practiced. And then finally I was like, I got this. I got the move down. I was like, time to do it with my jacket. I put the jacket on, and I taped it in place underneath there. It was all pressed flat. I stood in front of a mirror, and I went, Phew! and I set the jacket on fire. And just, like, this – horrible old sport coat that i used to wear everywhere just went up in flames while i'm wearing it i'm like oh god okay so now i don't do magic anymore that's the hot is right you get it we got uh nicole in chat saying i love this welcome to the stream nicole hope you're having a fantastic day as well here are some of the interiors from issue one and these are absolutely gorgeous i love how uh once again you know we've talked about this in a previous interview but how there's just, you know, mainly these two are the ones that have the color. Everything else is kind of like a darker tone or a gray tone. Um, this scene in particular is what I was talking about earlier, how everything's like reflecting in the ice cubes and 
just the rim of the drink right there. It's such a cool view. Uh, I, I I love it. Uh, what what I mean, I guess, inspired you for this scene? Um, throughout the book, uh, I try and have like as many reflections or distortions as I can. I, I think it's like such an integral part of what it means to be a, a person being observed. And um, obviously, in you know, if you look back to the, the Frankenstein movies, there's quite a lot of stuff with distortion and, and things with the with the lenses they use, but also with the way they um, they they frame the monster and things, and the way they frame her, and the way she's always obscured. And this, you know, in, in in the Bride of Frankenstein movie, she literally is only in it for like two minutes, where she just screams and gets exploded. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to like say like this is the most she'll ever be observed. So throughout both books, we're always seeing them through windows, distorted through the eyes, distorted through glasses, always like warped in some way. And then a lot of, I do a lot of stuff with mirrors and then um, a lot of like places where people are watching. In issue four, there's a lot of stuff where they're in a bar that has all these barriers everywhere. And so you're kind of always seeing them through the frames. Mm -hmm. And this is... Um, in issue one, there's a moment where a guy is taking photographs of them when they're sitting on the windowsill together. Uh, and so I wanted to like show like in issue two, that is now on TV. So we're seeing this direct line of like the paparazzi were outside her place. And now, now we're seeing it on the television uh, in the bar where they are. So they're having to like see themselves and realize on a delay that they've already been being observed this whole time. And just your paneling too, the way everything is just always moving and keeping your eyes going from you know one point to another it's just it's remarkable i mean i love this image in particular as well the reflection in the background on the mirror it's awesome and look i totally forgot to censor that one for kickstarter <laughs> here we are last day of the campaign Gotta last go day of the campaign there. screw it. what are they gonna do what are they gonna do <laughs> oops and right here the uh the lipstick washing down I just love how you're just so detailed with everything, like the curtains, you know, how you pull the curtains back and, you know, tur turning the water on and mm. and everything. And the tab you pull up for the shower, just, it's awesome. Well, I, I think, like, one of the big things that's missing from comics is sound, obviously. Um, and I want people to hear those sounds, those little things, you know, the, the, the little sounds of real life that almost never get covered in comic books. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I want you to hear the sound of that curtain pulling along that, that rail and looking at it and going, you know, it's those horrible metal, that's the metal hoops on the, um, <laughs> on the wooden rail rather than those nice ones with the little rollers on them and things. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I love this scene too, where it's, uh, is it fourth wall? It feels like where it, it is a little, yeah. Cause like the entire issue is set inside the apartment. Um, that first issue and so for them to like she literally opens the window and dangles herself outside of the comic and it, as you'll see on the next page as soon as she does that man photographs her which is what then ends up in the uh in the in the stuff in issue two anytime there's feet out you gotta you gotta be careful <laughs> so richard if uh there was sound in a comic and every time you opened up a comic it moaned what would you do moan right back <laughs> I love it. So let's go ahead and let's check out some of these rewards. And then we're going to scroll down those add-ons. So let's go ahead. We got a digital PDF copy of this at $7. How many uh, pages is this? Uh, it is a 22-page comic with uh, six pages of backup material. So twenty. And then we have the PDF catch-up of both issues at $10. So... Awesome price on that. You can get the emergency mini torch at ten dollars. And you said there is a QR code to download yep. issue two. Yep. So basically, you know, just for three more bucks, get yourself some awesome one of a kind emergency mini torches. Let me scroll down. Issue two, fair gray cover at fifteen. You know, it took me a couple of interviews before I realized Kickstarter switched everything up with these tabs at the top. Like I was scrolling through campaigns and I'm like, I can't find your rewards anywhere, guys. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I like, I haven't seen this before. What you're doing right now is blowing my mind. So, <laughs> and then you can get Dennis's cover coming in at twenty dollars. Uh, it's such a gorgeous piece. And then you can get the other variant at twenty as well. You know, uh, how many people do you think are going to cut out and piece this together? Oh, I hope a lot. I hope yeah. a lot of people are dressing her up. 
it's a shame the the magnets win work because that yeah. that would have been really cool. Yeah. And then the odds object catch up at twenty. So uh, what is it? What's that? That you get uh, the emergency sewing kit and the matches. Okay. So you get two things to keep in your bag with you wherever you go, and both com both PDFs. And then we have the physicals of issue one and two at thirty. Yeah. Uh, so what's the next odds and ends uh, you're going to do? Is that to yet to be determined, or have you figured it out yet? Um. So the because uh, the, the odd object was going to be the magnets for this book. Uh, and then it became the matches last minute, but fortunately I'd already sort of designed that for issue three. Um, so for issue three, I think what I will do now that I know the mag magnets are impossible is maybe, um, maybe coasters, a set of coasters. Uh, Ooh, what about lipstick? Sorry? Lipstick. That's yeah, that's, that's, that's the other option. It's, it's coasters or lipstick. And then uh, issue four, it is a, um, a seam cutter like for you know for unpicking uh sewing so that you can uh unpick yourself oh my god i love it this is really cool too the comic and pencils at 35 that's such a dirt cheap price for an original pencil from the issue and that'll be because i like to like the pages of pencils they're not what the final page looks like you get to see like the the raw rough version of it with all my mistakes and everything and i fold it up and stick it in at the page that you get that's so cool. That's so cool. I love that so much. And then you can get all three covers coming in at 45 so an awesome price for everyone out there that loves to collect variants. Both issues and two pages of pencils at 65 So, I mean, just an awesome price on that if you love some original artwork. Uh, we have the issue one and two cover bundle, so all the covers for issues one and two. Mm-hmm. And then the Richard Sucks collection. So this has over 500 pages of comics. Um, so this it's is a, a it's a huge digital bundle. You get Octopus, Too Hot for Octopus, Haunted Hill, Haunted Hill Pencil First, Haunted Hill Two, um, and uh, X Wives One and Two, and then like stickers and prints and all the other, you know, bullshit side pieces that have existed in the in the other campaigns. And then I have original pages. Um, there's five from each issue available. I think. I think three have sold. Oh, congratulations. That's so cool. We'll check them all out. Though, though I will say this. The only thing that is it, kind of a, a hassle is uh, any optional add-ons. You have to scroll through every single one. Oh, okay. Like, well, the, the, the add-on part is, is um, I should also highlight, uh, you, any, any book that comes as an add-on comes signed. Oh, um, so the reason I'm doing that is because a lot of people uh I should mention this. I won the Glad Award last I week. I was going I was gonna bring that up. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um I got a big trophy. It's very exciting. Um Do you have it with you? No, I do not. Sorry. Um I sh I should carry it everywhere. Damn. I? I was gonna say show it off, Richard. Um but so so four color heroes, the Glad Award winning graphic novel. Uh, for the, the one just last week uh, is available as an add-on for 25 bucks, and it does come signed. Because a lot of people were asking how they could get a signed one. I'm like, meet me at a convention or buy it from my Kickstarter. That's the smart. does not have signed comics. So that is smart. Copies, so, yeah, everyone should get themselves that because it's real good and keeps making people cry. And Ghost Ghost, of course, is uh, that, that's a touching one, too. I love it. Uh, Richard. For anyone who's on the fence about backing this with a couple hours left to go, what would you like to say to them to kind of help push them over that hump and get them to back? Um, you're not going to find any other comics like mine. Like, my, some of my comics are uh, divisive. Some people get upset because I have too many uh, female characters talking. Uh, I've been criticized for that a bit recently <laughs> by someone. What? Oh, yeah. Someone, someone literally told me that Haunted Hill would be better if Eva was a man. I was like... Cool. Okay. They, <laughs> Great. They, that they would find it easier to be on her side. <laughs> but like, cool. I we're not friends. Yeah, this uh, wasn't made for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, I have. I do a lot of different things. I do a lot of uh, comics that are not like anyone else's. If you like good dialogue-driven, uh, emotionally loaded but funny shit. If you like the kind of stories that are not being told being told for a change and if you like seeing um queer content that is 
uh, a little more a little more raw and sloppy than um, some of the smiley flag waving uh, pride content that's out there. Then my books are very good for that. Mm, sloppy. Yep. <laughs> you know, so I'm, Richard, a, I'm a I'm a hot dog enjoying adult boy as my Twitter I, profile. You know, I I remember you were upset that uh, not enough people took advantage of. They used the the awkward picture of you like sitting down, and not enough people used hot dog picture. So I made it a point to use the hot dog eating Richard as my uh, picture for the thumbnail. Thank you so much. I, <laughs> I almost had a bowl. We we grilled yesterday. I almost had a bowl of hot dogs here, but I didn't have enough time to to bust them out. <laughs> so, I, Richard, you go ahead. I gotta be. I gotta tell you this. I just so I just moved into a new place, uh, and so I walk in a different direction to get home. And I used to walk past this uh, venue down the street in between my office and my house, and I would time my walk home for like half an hour before any concert finished so that I would get there just as the hot dogs were being cooked, but before the crowds were there. So I could mm -hmm. buy a hot dog on my way home from work each day. And then I moved to this new place, no hot dogs between me and home at all. And now I've moved to a different place again. I walk through the hot dog smell, but I would have to veer off by like a block on Hollywood Boulevard to get a hot dog. And it's like, it's a tourist nightmare right now. Um, and it's kind of like really touristy because like the Oscars just happened. There's still kind mm -hmm. of some remnants around. People are really like getting in on that Hollywood Boulevard. And I, I like being on Hollywood Boulevard. It's a fun place to be because you get to like, if you walk past any kid looking at one of the stars, you can whisper to them, I can't believe they're buried right there. Um, but Damn. Like, <laughs> come on. You can't tell me you wouldn't do that. No, um, I would. <laughs> So, so like I'm having this challenge like every single day of like, it's, it's 11 o'clock at night. I want a hot dog. I can smell a hot dog, but I have to walk slightly out of my way. And I'm very excited that my office is a three minute walk from my house because I am a workaholic and to turn that into a nine minute walk just for a hot dog seems very, uh, I don't know it feels too luxurious for me. How many, uh, hot dogs per mile do you think you could walk? <laughs> i um i left a concert early like the first concert i went to after like you know once i was vaccinated back in 2021 um i left a concert early just to get hot dogs before the crowd and i was so excited to be buying hot dogs from someone on the street again that i bought five of them i ate four of them on the walk back to my office because again we're all like it's it's 11 o'clock on a saturday night i'm gonna go back to the office to do some more work is that so the three minute walk or no this this was this was more like a 15 minute walk so i, I was like shoot <laughs> i eat four of them on the way back to the office and i eat the fifth one sitting on the toilet so you know i guess i'm kind of a role model is what i'm yeah saying. yeah yeah you know i've been in some low points in my life but gobbling down a, a glizzy on the toilet that's until you have been, <laughs> you have been, Cody, uh, in, Codifer, if I may use your full name, <laughs> until you have been a guest at a prominent writers' festival in Australia, and you have arrived at a fancy ass hotel where they have seen your social media and purchased you a bucket of KFC that is waiting for you in the room, and then the next morning. You're sitting on the toilet in the case. <laughs> it's really just going right through you. And you forget to put the do not disturb sign on the door. And the maid walks in. And there's just this direct line of sight from open toilet door. Me sitting with the bucket between my legs on the toilet. Oh, like my God. That, that is low. That is the low point. <laughs> that is me at 32. That is the low point. And, and, and they're just not breaking the eye contact. Who, who won? <laughs> no one won. Like... <laughs> Like I just told that story on a podcast somehow as a point of pride. That that like that person is telling that story to a therapist for decades. They're like, I had to stop working in in, in hospitality because someone was eating fucking chicken while shitting. They sucked on their fingers. You just don't get it. <laughs> Here's the worst part. I was letting the bones just drop into the bowl. <laughs> Barbaric. <laughs> oh my god. Richard, you've been on the show before? We got to reel, reel you back in. Uh, for anyone out there looking to dive into a new area, something, you know, uncharted for them, you know, as someone who's been doing this for years and years and years, and you're pushing yourself every time you come out with a book, for someone looking to do the same, you know, what would you recommend is their best approach? I know just do it is, is kind of just, you know, how, you, how it gets done, but 
to break that that barrier that stops you from doing it how would you recommend going about that the barrier that stops you from doing it is being afraid you're gonna fuck it up so fuck up first fuck up as fast as you can and as hard as you can uh this is it's the old sketchbook trick every time you get a nice new sketchbook scribble some bullshit on the first page the like if you have a nice car, you hate it until it like it, it's perfect until it gets scratched once. That first scratch hurts more than any other scratch. Ruining the first page of a sketchbook hurts more than ruining any other page of a sketchbook. Just fuck it up straight away. I uh, I always just do an outline of my hand and then scribble all over it because then I'm like, it's mine. It's my fucking hand. This is my book from now on. I'm allowed to break it. It's the you know this is my hotel room. I'm allowed to eat KFC on the toilet here. This is this is the way to live. Uh, and the second part of it is draw on paper. Just draw on paper. Always learn to draw on paper. If you learn to draw digitally, and I, like look, draw digitally later on if you want to, whatever. You can make boring art if you like. But learn to draw on paper because that way you will have to learn to adapt when you fuck things up because you can't undo. You can always tell an artist who started digitally. I love that. Your advice is always so straight to the point. And that, that's one of my favorite things. I mean, we can chat and like we, we just get into some crazy, crazy stories. But when it comes to advice, you always come out with like, you know, just swinging with the best advice I hear. Richard, last but not least, what are you consuming outside of creating when you have time outside of hot dogs, too? I mean, like what books are you reading? What shows are you watching? Um, I am. I, I'm watching Girls 5 Eva at the moment. It fucking rules. Um, I am very excited about the final season of Curb Your Enthusiasm, but I'm kind of banking those to watch all in one go. Um, I suffered through the Avatar The Last Airbender live action, which was the most pointless garbage I've ever seen. Um, although I will say I'm really impressed that they managed to cast it with people whose heads were the exact same shapes as the animated characters. I have to assume <laughs> that was the decision making. Like, and that's not even an, like a dig. Like, they're really accurate. I very see. I, I have not heard it. Um or seen it, uh, heard it. I have not watched it. Um, I've heard, you know, some less than spectacular things, but I don't know. I always try it's, to watch it before I dog anything, you know what I mean? It's just sort of pointless. Like, I'm, I'm noticing that all the discussion online is people just going, hey, you know what's really good? The show, the original show. Let's just go watch that. It's the same. It's better. <laughs> just a good version of this. Um, and uh, I'm finally cracking into, like, this massive pile of, of books I've bought on Kickstarter. So I'm just kind of reading a lot of issue ones from the past two or three years that I never got around to. All right. All right. So, Richard, this is – I what this has to be your fourth or fifth time on the show. I, we've had you on a lot, I feel. I was on for Haunted Hill Online, Shed, Octopus, Haunted Hill Volume 1, Ex-Wives of Frankenstein – four color heroes yeah so this is number seven yeah you i think you might be the the, the on the shows in in its entirety probably someone who's been on the most time yeah i don't where, where, where i was going with that sentence i'm not exactly sure uh my structure could have been a little bit more tighter on that but yeah i think you are the number one right now we were talking about it with uh, edwin from lost between worlds and uh he was hitting i think it was his fourth interview Mm -hmm. uh and i was like oh wow like and then um i was editing our interview from a, a couple of shows ago and i like looked i'm like dude richard has him almost double <laughs> yeah. well, look, so my next the next thing coming out for me is whale published by blue fox comics which is a ghost story about why ghosts whale um and then right after that or maybe during that campaign i'm not sure on the timing yet i'm launching issue one of my new series wet cement which is a suburban horror set in new jersey in 2015 um and then uh horror shorts number two and the re-release of horror shorts one in full color uh where you get to see a story so close to my heart about a man eating corn on the toilet um <laughs> and so so any of those three i'll be available if you want to get me on for an eighth time Oh my god, we might as well just make it 8, 9, and 10th. <laughs> let, let me just put it this way. Cody, don't don't go nuts here, because I have 24 books coming out this year. Damn, dude. Yep. Damn! So how many pages are you pumping out a day? See, this is the problem, is that uh, because of moving into a new apartment, completely on foot, but I don't drive, and so I've had to like all the furniture I've gotten for this place. Cause I, I like took everything I had to Canada with me, came back to LA. I'm like, oh, nothing here. All right, move into a place, go on Facebook marketplace. What can I walk to and then carry back? Couch was hard. 
Um, I'm 38 years old. What the fuck am I doing? Anyway, uh, so because of that, because of like all the other crazy bullshit going on in my life, I'm getting like one page done a day at the moment. So I've got to figure out a way to speed shit up. Fortunately, I was so productive last year. So I have like a bunch of stuff that hasn't been released yet. Mm -hmm. so. You know, which is crazy. I, there's people watching this who do a page a day and that is for them is like pushing it to their limits. And there's people who do like a page every couple of days and you're like, ah, I'm only doing one a day. I'm not satisfied with that. I need to do four or five. Like I remember, I remember a half a year ago, year ago, Richard like DMing in the group, like, yeah, I'm, you know, I got to stay, I'm sleeping four hours a day. I'm pumping out five, six pages. I'm like, dude, I'm concerned about your health, man. Like, <laughs> so I'm down to three hours a day on sleep. Um, what I do is, uh, I, I go home from 11 till four and I have like one hour to have a drink on the phone with my husband who's in Canada. I swear he exists. Uh, and then I sleep for three hours, get up, make breakfast, shower, walk to the office. I get here by 4 a.m. Um, and then I just work through. Um, the thing that slows me down is coloring because I find it so boring. Uh, it's like the final part of coloring where you're making shit look nice again. Great. But if you do, if you do your own coloring, it goes like this. Draw a page. Wow, my page looks great. I'm so happy with this finished page. Now I'll scan it. Let me zoom in real close and color it in to do the flats. Like, it's it's the most basic stay within the lines bullshit. And you're looking at your work so fucking close. Like, it's like, like a microscope for mistakes. So you spend this middle hour just being like, I hate myself and I'm bad at everything I do. And so that turns into two hours because you don't want to look at it. So you get distracted by anything you possibly can, like watching three seasons of Girls 5 Ever in the past three days, for instance, <laughs> just a hypothetical example. So it's, 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 it's always that part for me. But um, when I'm doing uh, this, my new book, The Lights That Guide You Home, is all like a mixture of watercolor and collage. And so that one, like there is no digital part in it. So that one feels great. We have a get back to more shit like that. We have Nicole. I haven't uh, finished this panel since y'all started. <laughs> it's me. I'm people. <laughs> so Richard, when is the next thing coming out from you? Give us uh, some sort of timeline for you. Uh, I think it's, look, I don't have 100% clarity on when Whale is being released by Blue Fox. How's that it's, spelled? Is it W-H-A-L-E or? No, W-A-I-L. Um, it's, a, it's a story about sadness and regret and ghosts. Um, is either this week or next see uh, when you, you said whale and i wasn't sure because i know you came out with octopus i was like if he's coming out with another like sea creature this is going to be unheard of oh and also um uh michelle abinader's book uh when i was young the the stories of like it's like it's a big thing on backer kit raising money for the trevor project which mm -hmm. is trying to eliminate suicide and queer youth um it's stories of like hope from being young and i've done a five page uh piece for that called miserable fun about uh present day me using a paper cup phone to talk to myself at a very awkward phase in my childhood i so love that's, that that's live now and everyone should go and go on back her kid and back that because it, it, i'm actually it's setting up a show with uh michelle uh we're we're in the works we're we're in the dm trying to figure it out uh so i i definitely uh is that on the kickstarter or like any of the interiors or is that uh, just in the book it's just in the book. I'm going to be doing a big update to all my octopus backers uh, tomorrow or the next day about that one because I figure they're the ones who are most likely to care about another story about me. Um, but yeah, that one, it's it, it's live on Backer Kit right now, so everyone should go there. But I think, so the first review of Whale came out last week on the newest rant. I gave it a five out of five, so it is technically perfect. <laughs> um, and so that one, yeah, is either this week or next. And then Wet Cement... I'm fulfilling X Wives of Frankenstein. Uh, the the um, the matches are here. The sewing kits are are all put together already. Um, the books are due to arrive on the 28th. I'm at WonderCon from the 29th to the 31st, and then I'm in LA from the first till the third. So I'll be doing all the fulfillment those days because I got to go back to Canada for medical stuff on the fourth. Um, and so I think I'll probably launch Wet Cement if I can get enough of it colored ahead of time um on the fifth or whatever the nearest tuesday is to the fourth all so right probably the ninth well everyone and watching shorts will be late april and then x wives three is may 
then the Richard Fairgray comic book character comic strip collection, uh, which is called uh, The Funny Ones, The Good Ones, and many more, is also May. And June will be Lights to Guide You Home and Wet Cement 2. July will be X-Wives 4, finishing this, Horror Shorts 3. And I don't know the rest of the year 100% yet, but I've got my new a compilation of horror stories about shitting called Things That Go Dump in the Night. I fucking love it. Oh, that's so good. Everyone watching right here is a link to the Kickstarter. Be sure to back it. And if you're unable to back it, put it wherever you can. Word of mouth is 100% free and it costs you nothing. We do have to wrap it up. So I hope you all have a lovely Tuesday. But most importantly, guys, keep it geekly. Keep it dumping. <laughs> Dump it geekly, baby.